Hi, Christine. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so excited that you're here. Y'all, I'm with Christine Schneider, who I've known for, honestly, like at this point, it feels like almost 10, it, maybe around 10 years, which feels like I'm aging myself. I mean, at this point, <laughs> aren't we all? But like, I mean, for anybody who does not know you, who are you today? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I am a manual therapist. So I work in New York City and in Pennsylvania, and I provide manual treatment for professional voice users. So I do have specialization in laryngeal therapy and TMJ therapies. However, I do think it's very important to take in the whole. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, anything with symptoms around the voice could be coming from somewhere else in the body. Um, so I do think it's important to just mention that. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have, I now have three associates working with me in New York City, which is awesome. It's so wild. And, I love that. <laughs> and I also have, um, so that's Life Light Massage. And then I also have the Visceral Voice. And I have the Visceral Voice podcast. And I have a whole program on the Visceral Voice where I have a self-care program, which is now an 18-week program in the fall and the spring where we cover something different each week. And then I teach classes. Uh, right now I'm currently teaching a class, Experiential Anatomy with Jared Trudeau. And coming up in December, I teach a class on the vagus nerve, what happens in Vegas with <laughs> Andrew Byrne. Uh, so I do a lot of anatomy teaching and, uh, and that's a lot of that's online. I run a conference with Penn State, One Body, One Voice just really trying to make sure that um, our voice teachers and our voice users are remembering that the voice is truly a whole body experience. So to remember to take it whole body. Uh, and that's kind of my mission <laughs> is for is just to kind of share how brilliant the body is and to, you know, be be mindful of that and mindful that everything is full body. And then uh, I just started working this year as the movement coach for um, the Metropolitan Opera Lindemann Young Artist Program. So kind of uh, several different hats. <laughs> cool. So like you do nothing with your time. It's really the bottom line. Literally yeah. nothing with your time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I should also mention though, um, I am a mommy and my daughter is seven. Um, so I do have several evenings where I'm a chauffeur <laughs> and also a caretaker. And yeah, I was just, yeah. I'm, it's also just wild to hear how much you've grown and this mm -hmm. and your multifaceted business has grown since I feel like I've known you. And it's just been so wonderful because you truly are so brilliant at what you do. So thank you for being here. I want to dive you. on in. Before we even do that, tell people how you got to this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really was so personal. I had experienced a major life-saving surgery when I was in high school um, and for two and a half years, uh, well, I was born with a concave chest, so pectus excavatum. And, uh, when I was in eighth grade, I was in a car accident that they think what happened, we are not sure, but they think that because of the way that the seatbelt was on me through a very important growing period, that kind of started a rotation. But regardless, a rotation of my sternum happened, a 90 degree rotation, wow. which made the ribs start to cross each other. And therefore the right rib cage was coming toward the heart. Um, the bottom of the sternum is called the xiphoid process. And that process was puncturing one of my lungs. Um, and that was just slowly happening from eighth grade to you know, halfway through 10th grade as I was growing. And finally, I was able to find a doctor, two doctors who were able to do a life-saving surgery. And that was it. I just kind of, my life was saved and I had to figure out, you know, wow, I, I have these dreams that I kind of didn't expect to live to experience. And now I'm alive. And what does that mean? And kind of had to come through all of that, which took me a very long time to come, to come through all of that. Um, and, but as a singer and I, I double majored in vocal performance and French horn performance. So as a singer and a horn player, I 
didn't know how to incorporate my breath. My, you know, I had my surgery here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So right under, they did it that way. Um, A lot of times they'll do it vertically, but they did do it horizontal for me. Was it under the Um, rib cage? Is that what you're pointing to? Like under your, it was, it was like under the breast tissue. Yeah. Um, they, that's where they did the incision as opposed to directly vertical. So that, you know, I, people wouldn't see it as much. They weren't sure how I would be with having a big scar across my chest. Mm -hmm. Um, although I do, I mean, hardly anyone ever sees it, but I do try to wear it, but you know, if a shirt shows it or something, I do try to wear it proudly. I do think that our scars are part of who we are and the experiences that we've had. And I don't think that they're anything to be ashamed of. I actually think they're quite beautiful Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I mean, they just show what our bodies are capable of and what they do in order to help us heal. Um, So I definitely try to wear my scars proud. So, you know, I am grateful that they did it horizontal, but I don't think it would have mattered if they had done it the other way. Um, At least not to, to me and how I've come to, you know, really appreciate the human body. And so I had this major disconnect between voice and body. I mean, Mm -hmm. I, I still don't, if I palpate the center of my chest, I still don't have feeling unless I push really deep, then I can kind of feel the sternum. I do still have wiring around the sternum. Um, but superficially I, I don't have feeling there. So it's very easy for me to have a disconnect from my voice to my body, which is why it's my mission to help us as voice users understand that our body is under us because it's been my life of learning how to feel my body again underneath and what is what I've now I now call pressure management which is breath because for me the word breath caused a lot of anxiety I I, yeah. I would throw me into PTSD and you know music directors would be like Christine breathe you're not breathing and uh, conductors when I was playing French horn, Christine, you've got to breathe. You're too sharp or whatever, you know? Yeah. And they'd be like, yeah, okay. You know, and I'd hear it and my body would immediately just tense up. And so I've, I've come to learn how to breathe and how to regulate that within my nervous system. When I hear that word, um, and I call it pressure management and how to build intra-abdominal pressure to help Uh, so that I'm not having too much subglottic pressure above and how that all works. And I do a lot of teaching on that now from having to understand it within my own body. So that sort of led me to that disconnect, um, led me to Joan later, my mentor, my voice teacher, whom I love. And um, there was never any issue with the cords. It was just an issue with the coordination of my breath and of my body. And then I would try to tell people like, Hey, you know, who really needs a manual therapist voice users, you should do that. You're looking for a job, you know? (laughs) And then they'd be like, no, that's, I don't think that's exactly right for me. And after a while I was like, I guess I should, I I I should do this. Yeah. And I did. And I got into it and I told my agent and then I told my family once I had already started school, I told my agent before I started school and then my family, I told after my friends, I told after I just didn't want anyone to try to persuade me to not Mm. do it. And I was like, no, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. And I don't, I don't want anyone telling me that maybe it's not. And now some of the voices that were like, I don't know. No, I don't know that this is right for you. Now they're like, wow, I, I didn't realize how right it was for you in your yeah. path. Yeah. So, Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it's a very vulnerable story. And it's also one that I think gives um, context for people who are really mission based. It's usually like coming from a place that it stems personally. And so um, it's very clear for me having worked with you, like that it isn't just something that you do. It's something that is a part of you. And so it's just really, really wonderful to see that it's just like a holistic situation. And so thank you for sharing that. I I, I want to talk practically about the actual, um, I guess it would be like, man- I don't know what the phrasing would be like, maneuvering work, um, like the actual doing of the thing that you do <laughs> on clients. And then let's veer after that into more like the abstract thought of the things. 
So what mm -hmm. exactly, if you had somebody say on your table, are you doing with one human to work with them? Yeah. Well, when they first come in, they've already filled out a medical intake form, which I should absolutely say that not everything is remembered and put on a medical intake form. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of things start coming up later and they're big things. A lot of times it's the big T stuff yeah. that is left off the medical forms. And do you feel like um, it's just because people genuinely, like their body knows more as in like the body holds the score. And then all of a sudden while you're touching something, it's like, oh no, that's, oh, I had no idea that. that okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And then it's like, oh yeah, I forgot. I have had, you know, 60 stitches across mm -hmm. my armpit or something. And you're like, okay, yeah, that's, that's, you know, would you like to share more about that or whatever? Mm -hmm. and, but certainly something I'm going to write in to add to yeah. that intake form. Um, so they've done a medical intake form and they come in and I always ask again, I've already read through their intake form. I'm like, so what brings you in today? What's going on? Because I want to hear someone express it. And I want to hear, I want to listen to what's happening with the voice, what happens as they're trying to describe something when, you know, what happens if they go into a little bit of laughter or a little bit of, you know, what are they able to do? So I'm really listening and watching, paying attention to what, uh, what it looks like as someone's talking, not to make anyone nervous that comes in to see me, yeah. but, um, but I'm just kind of keeping an eye on, on things and seeing what might be overworking, what, and so that's sort of the first assessment is just kind of listening to someone talk and hearing their story and what their perception of the experience is that kind of led them there. What was the onset? And then running them through some movement assessments to see. Um, we are taught in laryngeal manual therapy to do assessments through palpation. I do not do them yet. I don't do them at the beginning of the session. My palpation doesn't happen until a little further into the session. For people um, who don't know, what is palpation? Palpation is hands-on touch. So right. when I'm actually feeling the tissue, great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just don't do that hands-on laryngeal palpation because they haven't experienced my touch yet. The nervous system, I do believe that everything that I'm doing in a session is having a conversation with someone's nervous system. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the structures that I'm going into work around are innovated by our vagus nerve, <laughs> which is how we can help get into our parasympathetic nervous system. So it can be a very relaxing treatment, but we can also get really anxious or nervous. So to startle someone by bringing that touch in, it's just something we don't do at LifeLight, though other practitioners do, and I'm sure it works out totally fine. Um, but I do kind of hold off a little bit and I don't, I, I watch through assessment as someone's doing things. I'll watch them move their mouth. I'll watch them take the swallow, maybe a hum. I have them do some full body movements um, an overhead squat. I have, you know, I have them do different movements and kind of check it out. And depending on what their story was, what their history is, is dependent on kind of what assessments I'm interested in. And then I get them on the table and then we kind of find out what's, what's overactive, what needs to be released. Um, part of what led me to be a movement specialist in the last several years has been that I felt like a huge part was left out when we're just providing manual therapy. I think massage is great. I think what we're capable of doing is wonderful or how we're capable of, I don't think we're doing it. First of all, I think our, your body is doing it. We're just facilitating, you know, I do not view myself as a healer and I don't think that we should. I believe your body is the healer. We are just helping facilitate that your body into remembering or, or kind of plugging it back in to the brain to go, Oh yeah, right. That area of the body. Um, but trying to help facilitate that and bring it back into awareness is what we're doing or what I'm trying to do with someone on the table. And then in with movement, it's like <laughs> with hands-on, I was seeing someone maybe for 60, maybe 90 minutes a week, maybe if it's even a week, I, you know, maybe it's a month, once a month. And what's happening in between that, right. you know, all of this movement, all, all of everyday stuff, everyday life. So I, in the last several years became a movement specialist as well so that I could kind of help coach how the movement is going through 
through the rest of the time so that we can release what's overactive. We can activate what's underactive and then we can integrate it into a more successful full body, full kinetic chain motion. Amazing. Amazing. When you've been working with a client for a while, what have you found to be some, I don't like this word, but like successful markers for you? Like what are, what allows you to see progress? Is it just more of openness of breath? Is it more somebody's literal energy and attitude as they enter in? What are some of these markers that you are looking for or that you can sense are moving things along? Yeah, definitely those two. Breath is key. How is someone able to manage their pressure system? Um, And ease, certainly ease of voicing. And therefore, they're just feeling like they're not having to work so hard um, because the the areas that were overworking were the smaller areas that aren't meant to or or in some areas, the larger muscles that have taken over for our intrinsic or our inner uh, muscles that should be doing stuff. So certainly all of that. Um, yeah, more ease with the voice, more ease with swallowing. Um, no, getting out of pain. We definitely want people to get out of pain, getting them to be at a point where they're out of discomfort. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, feeling good in their voicing, feeling good in their swallowing, feeling good in their movement. Um, those are all things that I expect to see. And we do say, and I, I did, I have trained my associates to, we give four sessions. And if we're not seeing a difference in four sessions, or if that person's not feeling a difference in four sessions, I, I want to refer them to another practitioner because there are so many mo- modalities and w- there are too many for one practitioner to be trained in mm-hmm. and not everyone responds to every modality and that's okay. That just means that, okay, if you're not responding within, like, usually someone will respond within a, a first session <laughs> and let alone four. So four has, has definitely given us a lot of information. And if someone hasn't, if they're, if they haven't responded to the treatment in four sessions, I don't want to waste their time and I don't want to waste their money. Yeah. So I will refer them on to whatever other, pra- you know, hands-on practitioner I think might be right for what is going on with that person. Um, but I think that that's important to recognize too. I think having a team is really important. And my team, of course, I have speech therapists and laryngologists and voice teachers and, you know, everything on my team, but I also have other body work practitioners on my team. I have physical therapists on my team and osteopaths and chiropractors and acupuncturists and, uh, and other massage therapists who are just trained, you know, lymphatic drainage maybe, or, uh, visceral manipulation or neuromeningeal manipulation or whatever it might be that could, you know, be a different approach for the individual that could be more beneficial for them perhaps yeah. than what they might be experiencing. I think that's such a helpful reminder for a cross training, you know, like we're not just talking voice, we're talking your body, we're to everything where, you know, sometimes, and frankly, just like representation, everything. It's just like, sometimes we're, (laughs) we're told like, well, this is the best one. And okay, let's go there, you know, as a referral, but also it might not be the best one for you. And I think Mm -hmm. that reminder that you as an individual require something specific for yourself. And while the person that somebody referred to you may be really incredible, it might not just be, it might not work with your body and you as a human being. And I think that's really humbling to be reminded of. And also that you at your practice do that because it's not about, well, I need to keep every client that I have. It's like, no, no, no. The whole point is to find help for you as an individual. And who can I give you or refer you to that will do that for you? Yeah. And I think that's important for us to remember too, as, and, and I do have a difficult time with this as a practitioner that I can't help everyone. And that's like, oh, because believe me, if, if it were up to me, I would help everyone. (laughs) I believe you. (laughs) But, um, but exactly what you said, sometimes there's just not, it's not the right fit. And Mm -hmm. to know that as a therapist as well, because there are a lot of times that it's like, you were highly recommended to me and I'm so happy to be here and you're the best and I need you to fix me. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Like I, 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 my thought is, I don't say this out loud, but my thought is I want more than 
anything in the world to fix mm-hmm. you. But that is also a lot of pressure on me <laughs> yeah. to fix you. Yeah. And I don't believe it's my hands fixing you. I believe it's your body fixing you. Mm. And and so I do say something along those lines of like, okay, well, I, you know, I believe that we can help your body yeah. to be healed in the healing. And I always stem from a, a point of hope that mm-hmm. our bodies can be healed because I believe in them so much. They are truly brilliant. Yeah. As society, we're taught that we only need help once it's broken. And I would love to talk about that. Like when one starts finding a team in this way, because I would imagine that every single one of us has something that is locked or has some form of physical, unknown, subconscious trauma that is in our bodies that maybe we're not even aware of that a physical you know, touch would actually release. I know like for me, I came to you, it was a traumatic situation and I came to you from trauma, which was like something happened and I needed help rather than like, oh, right. I use my voice a on a daily basis because I'm a human being who has the privilege of speech, but also as a performer, and this is my literal instrument, I'm using this in a way that is an overuse over a quote unquote regular person who doesn't. And this should just be part of my you know, integration of my instrument. Why or when or how should we begin with people like yourself? (laughs) Now. (laughs) Now. (laughs) But yes, I mean, it's a rhetorical question, really. But like, how do we change that narrative? What do we do to obviously having you on this podcast is in hopes of bringing more awareness to like, this is something that ideally is a part of somebody's process. Yeah. Building the team as early as you can, no matter where you are, whether you're listening to this and you're in high school or in college or in as a professional or where, wherever you are in your life, starting to build your team. And that, and actually you can also recognize the team that you already have and then how to build onto that team, because we all have teams. We have our friends, you know, we have perhaps certain family members, our family or certain family members, or I mean, whoever it is in our individual lives, we already have started to build a team. So we recognize the team that we have. And then we start building on from there of what we feel like we need. Maybe we want a personal trainer, or maybe we want an Alexander teacher, or maybe we want a voice teacher, or maybe we want um, a mental health coach or a life coach. Um, So it's just kind of thinking about what we want on our team. And the great thing is that you don't need to see all these people every single week. It's just a matter of having having who you know and feel that you trust so that when you are feeling like, oh, I think I, I'm like, I'm starting to feel a little something. Let me check in with so-and-so that we start to recognize when we're, you know, oh, okay, I'm starting to feel a little bit of neck stuff. I know that that's when I feel like I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders, maybe I should talk to my, you know, my mental health coach or my psychotherapist or whatever, just to kind of get out whatever it is that I'm trying to like hold on my shoulders right now or whatever it is that any individual is going through. So beginning to build a team and certainly when you're healthy, I mean, we, we say all the time in the voice world, get an image, get, um, get a scope of your voice while the cords are you know, while you're singing really well, because you never know there, you could have something congenital on your cords that isn't bothering you at all. Yeah. And then later on, if something happens and you get an image, it's like, what? I have a sulcus. I, oh my gosh, what do I do about this? And maybe it's been there all along and it's not something that's new. So getting a scope as early as you can and just seeing what that's like. And doubling back for those who don't even know, where does one even go to do this? Yeah, to a laryngologist or an ENT. Mm -hmm. Laryngologists are ENTs, are ear, nose and throat doctors who specialize in the throat, (laughs) who specialize with the larynx, so the laryngology. So certainly much easier to find in a place like New York City, a little harder to find in smaller areas, smaller towns, smaller cities, you would probably have to go to an ENT. Mm -hmm. Um, Some speech therapists do it. And some of them are really, really, really good. Dr. Wendy LeBourne is like phenomenal at doing scopes. Um, And so some speech therapists have their own and they can do it too. But just kind of getting, yeah, seeing, seeing what's, seeing what's going on when everything's healthy and feeling good. And, um, 
And then also on that, if you do get a diagnosis, um, it, it isn't, it's only a thing, but it isn't everything. It's not who you are. It's not your identity. Um, and how many times I've seen people come into my clinic who have, you know, kind of changed their life and it has become their identity, their diagnosis has. And then what happens if like the di- they go see someone else and the diagnosis isn't the same mm-hmm. or it's not there or so when you hear a diagnosis, we take it in and it's like, okay, and we can feel that. I don't want to say don't feel it, but also like, okay, maybe I'll get a second opinion and okay. And remembering that there are like diagnostic codes too, that they're working with. So if they're going to recommend certain treatment or if they're going to recommend certain uh, medication or something, I mean, we are having to deal with diagnostic codes for insurance purposes and all of that too. So there is more that goes into it too. And just trying to take in like, okay, I got this diagnosis. What does this mean? Let me go get a second opinion. Okay. They're differing or okay. They're the same. And so what are my choices from here? Um, But that there's so much more than, and you're so much more than that diagnosis. And even a diagnosis of a pathology on a vocal cord um, is not career ending. Yeah. So also knowing that like it, it will be okay. I love all of that. So very much, especially again, the, (laughs) the reminder that like, when we are in our quote unquote neutral state, like that is actually when we're able to do all of like the preemptive work, right? Like people are always like get into therapy when you're feeling great. People are like, yeah. why would I do that? And it's like, well, cause that, then you can actually talk about like the stuff rather than all the things that are happening in real time that you need to navigate in real time. It's all about like, let's unpack the things that are already there that you come into, you know, it's just another facet of really just seeing where you are in real time. I always, I've had this conversation and this is maybe me being a neurotic Jew, but like why we don't like have, and I understand radio, like you just want the radiation, none of that, but like why we don't have a basic full body MRI at like certain points in our lives just to see how your body has begun to, in my mind, like collapse, but like, you know, just (laughs) to really see like the scope of it. Um, And I understand all the reasons why one would not do that. And also the people who would be more prone to be like, oh no, everything's broken. If it's a small little thing that, you know, I I get all of that. But also in my mind, it's like, I would love to know what I looked like. And then now as I keep working from there and all the things start falling apart as you get older, you know, like if it's my fault or whether it's just my body living its life, Anyway, well, that's the thing that happens later on, right? You start to get imaging and then it's like, I mean, I'm 43 and and I always, I never mind sharing my age because I do not feel 43, but I, I, there's no way that I could look, I, I could go in for an imaging and not have stuff. Right. Oh, yeah. Once you're in your 30s, or once oh you're my a certain God. age, like Please. you're gonna see disc herniations. You're gonna see, and it you can go down a rabbit hole of like, yeah. Uh, and I did. You know, I was like, okay, look at this, and then it was like, okay, you have this on your liver, and you have a very rare thing called uh, left renal vein compression, which only like point zero zero five percent of the population. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, I survived a mass, a major thoracic surgery. Maybe that's why. I don't know. But there's no, you know, it was like a rabbit hole of stuff that you're finding yeah. out um, when you get imaging. And I mean, it, it is true that it's like, well, if I had the image like 20 years ago, maybe I'd know if I had yeah. this from before or if this was from my pregnancy. I don't know. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. that is true. But yeah. But no, it's the also a rabbit hole. Would and, be bad. <laughs> yeah, the radiation, the rabbit hole that would then happen afterwards on the Google. Like nobody yeah, needs any that of that. Mean? Oh my God. That's the worst. Let me Google MedMD. No, no, thank you. Truly, we're all <laughs> Scaries come out to thrive. Like that is the Google search. Um, So with all of that, we are now in a space where, I mean, we're still in quote unquote COVID times, but it's like the post stressful COVID times. I would love to hear about how or if that affected the work that you have been doing, the work that you are doing with your clients, if you're seeing shifts from that in the held maybe subconscious and or conscious trauma of our bodies and how that has been perhaps a shift. Yeah, it's been a major shift. Um, 
we had chatted a little bit before about when I first, I, I came back to work July of 2020. Oh, wow. And so before we even had vaccinations, yeah. I was in full PPE. Um, so I was working in full PPE with people and the nervous systems were rocked, really rocked. People even then, were, even like a couple months in. Oh, that, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I mean, people were coming back in and I mean, it. people who were used to touch were coming back in and it was like, we had to work with breath and very gentle touch to try to regulate the nervous system before we could even go in and really do any kind of manipulation of tissue. Yeah. Uh, and that, that was right away. And, and then now having had some time, what I'm seeing in the last few months for sure is that s- schedules have gotten really busy again. Mm-hmm. So our schedules have picked up. A lot of us are back to our full-time schedules, which, you know, for our demographic are like Insane. three full-time schedules. Yeah. Um, we are all, you know, very on the go. <laughs> Most of us are like on the go personalities with, you know, who are workaholics. I, I, I'll call myself that. I don't want to call yeah. anyone else that, but I'll join um, you, but sure. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the two of us yeah. here are workaholics. Yeah. We're workaholics and we just have, you know, a lot. And what had, we had a point where we did slow down and it was like, yeah, why did I work so much? And then now we're, I see, and I see my clients as well coming in and they're back to full schedules, but life has also been altered in many ways. Like maybe some of them had kids over the Mm -hmm. pandemic and all of a sudden they're like back to full schedules of travel and everything, but they also have a baby now. And how do they manage that? The, the schedule they had before, which was super intense. And now they have a child on top of that. How do you manage that? Or now you're back to, you know, full scheduling, but we've had the experience of what we've had over the last couple years of the pandemic. And a lot of us, you know, in certain settings are still fully, I mean, I'm, I'm fully masked all day long. I wear the mask on the bus in, I wear the mask all day at the clinic. I wear the mask at the Met. I wear, you know, and then I wear the mask on the bus back home. So I'm in a mask all day long. And how does that affect our communication? Because our, our facial expressions are so important. And, and then in our, you know, yeah. So I'm really, a lot of my clients, uh, especially now that I have three associates, a lot of my clients I've been seeing for a while. So they are very comfortable coming in and voicing saying like, I'm just, I'm super stressed. I'm really anxious. I don't know how to, you know, process where my nervous nervous system is now with the schedule that I have always kept in my life. And now that I'm so busy again, well, how do I do this? And so it is a lot of coming into techniques to regulate the nervous system, whether someone does tapping techniques that they've learned from, you know, their psychotherapist or whether someone uses um, sensory cues, so using your eyes or using your touch or using your smell or taste or whatever it is, sometimes that can help bring you back into a present moment, whatever tools that you have, but really building up, really grabbing onto some of those tools to help because it has, I absolutely see it. And, and in our, you know, my daughter's seven and in that population as well. I mean, I, that's not the ones I'm feeling had it the roughest, honestly. Yeah. I feel like, you know, our junior high, high school, college kiddos. Yeah. We'll see the got, ramifications of that, I think, yeah. in the next couple of years for sure, unfortunately. I so yeah. Um, I mean, with obviously it's not a one size fits all clearly because everybody, you know, holds things differently in their bodies and has different bodies. But, you know, you mentioned a couple of these tools that, that can, you know, bring some, I don't know if the words like relief, but what else have you found for people who are coming in holding in some capacity, even just like on a regular day-to-day basis is a real tangible generalized assistance towards that of relief in that yeah I think one is 
uh, I chuckle because I'm going to say breath, <sighs> but, but, but thinking of it, part of what helped me for a number of years is thinking of an internal massage. Mm. So I would just, instead of trying to think breathe and then forcing myself to do something and having it feel very effortful, just trying to think of my body creating its own internal massage and what that can feel like without adding a lot of extra effort. Mm -hmm. So certainly coming into any kind of quote, breathing exercises that might be that resonate with each individual um, movement, movement really helps the system. Laughter, mm. laughter really helps the system. Um, I, one of my, <laughs> one of my favorite little games that we ever played, I was in Joan Rosenfeld's acting class and she had us all lay our head on other people's bellies. Mm -hmm. And then the first person had to start laughing and then the heads jiggle and yeah. you can't help but laugh because your head's <laughs> jiggling around. And so you're laughing so hysterically and she probably let it go on for, I don't even know, probably only like three or four minutes though. It felt like a very long time. Mm -hmm. And we all got up and then walked around the room and our experience and our presence in the room was very different than it had been before. Yeah. And I think exercises like that, that, you know, it's hard to just be like, well, laugh. And you're like, yeah, um, I'm super anxious right now. I don't know how to laugh, you know, <laughs> until you do because you're so anxious. And then you're like, is this really laughter? You're like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, I'm not sure this might be discomfort. Yeah. Um, I might, I might cry in four seconds. Like, I'm not sure where this is coming from. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And that's fair too. We, you know, I'll see that and I'll see that after a laryngeal release. Sometimes there are certain things we see. Um, and sometimes someone's like, I'm laughing. Like, I don't even know why I'm laughing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's okay. If that's okay too. Or like, I don't know why I'm crying right now. I don't even know what's processing out. It's okay not to know what's processing out. We mm -hmm. don't have to put a image or a name to everything. It's just that your body's ready to just let go of whatever that is. And, and we do do that through laughter too. Yeah. Um, so those are different aspects of, yeah, but move, I think, you know, movement, motion is lotion, <laughs> movement is medicine. <laughs> motion is lotion. That's a new motion one is me. lotion. Movement is medicine. Any of that getting up and, you know, get moving, go out on a walk, um, be, be with nature if you can, mm -hmm. um, whatever that is for you. I like being around water. Anything with water helps me kind of calm down, but, um, and, and also just your own hands, your own touch or, you know, a partner or a loved one's touch of just a very like gentle, Hey, I mean, I think that's something that part of what rocked our systems was that we didn't have our community. Yeah. We didn't have them face to face. Um, and we didn't have touch. Yeah. So just to provide even just like placing your hand on your chest a little bit and just kind of giving some self affirmation or, you know, or doing that for a loved one and just being like, Hey, I'm just touching their arm or wherever, um, without any intention behind it other than support of, yeah. or, you know, just a caring hand. I think yeah. that can, that can be helpful too. Yeah. This is reminding me of my one of my mentors, one of my dearest friends now, one of my grad school professors, Jeffrey Crockett, who I don't know if you, do you know Jeff? I don't know. I need to introduce you to because I think y'all would be like besties. Yay. <laughs> he's he's oh my God, he's so he's the most brilliant. He combines uh, many different modalities, but he was our voice and breath, basically, movement teacher in grad school. And mm -hmm pretty much for three years, we like sat on stools and breathed, which sounds like um, pointless and was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my whole life. Um, mm -hmm. And that first year, I just remember sitting there on that stool and it was impossible. It was impossible mm -hmm. just to sit there and be with my breath. And like the reminder that the breath comes and goes on its own. And mm -hmm. so often we hold on to it and we forget that we're not breathing. And yet also when we're sleeping, our breath knows what it's doing and it keeps us alive. It literally is the thing that allows us to stay on this planet. And we often, we lose sight of the fact that it knows more than we do. 
and to just come back to it as the thing that knows um, is so hard. And so I just want to like affirm for anybody who's listening, who's like, oh, right, I don't. I don't. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, we're like taught to not like even as, and I teach this with like voice students of mine and adults who, you know, voice students of mine. It's like, yeah, we're taught as little kids when you're sitting in a circle in kindergarten, like, OK, everybody take a big, deep breath in. And you, you're, ch- you're taught to like breathe in from your chest to take this massive breath. When really it's just like what really breathing in is like, no, 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 let's fill our lower bodies. Like let's, let's just like, it's a 360 experience through your back. Like we're not, you know, we're taught out of the thing that our body literally knows on its own. Yeah. I think our, our body breathes over 22,000 times a day just on its own. It is, you know, our, our respiratory diaphragm is innervated by our vagus nerve and our phrenic nerve. So it has what's known as uh, somatic and visceral. Um, So visceral being the vagus nerve and somatic. So the controlled motion of it being through that phrenic nerve. Tell people where the, tell people where these nerves are in there, if they don't know where the vagus nerve is. And yeah. Well, the the vagus nerve is the wandering nerve. It's the largest nerve of the body. So it's wandering everywhere, basically innervating a lot of our organs, our viscera, The phrenic nerve is the, um, is for the diaphragm. So we say C3, C4, C5. So vertebra in our cervical spine, our neck. So out from C3, C4, C5 keeps the diaphragm alive. So it comes down and innervates the diaphragm. So these nerves that are helping us breathe this amazing muscle organ that is conscious and unconscious or subconscious. So it's happening all the time. Just like you mentioned, when we're sleeping, the diaphragm is always working. Um, Our heart, our heart is always pumping. There are amazing things about the heart. Um, If you don't mind, I might just give a a few little like really cool things about certain organs. Please. Yes. These are things that I'm like, isn't this amazing? Like our bodies, what? How does this? So our hearts, um, they have little brains. So a little brain of its own, they have little neurites, about 300,000 neurites in the, in the heart. Um, and so the heart has memory. Um, and sometimes we've seen that in heart transplants, that there are memories within the heart, which is really fascinating. Um, the liver, our livers have over 500 functions in the liver. Also a healthy liver, you could dissect it. You, you could, uh, remove 90% of it and it will grow back. It will regenerate into a fully functioning liver. Uh, I mean, it's the human body. And the more I've learned about it, the more I'm like, what is this miraculous machine that we get to live in? Like I get to, I get to live in this really cool machine every day. This is amazing. And there are so many things that we're learning all the time about. We don't, there are so many questions that we can ask that we don't know the answer to. We don't know what certain, you know, cells are or what this function is and what it's doing for us. Um, you know, and we're often looking at to explore other things. Um, and then when we become a somanot, <laughs> so looking inside the body, all the things that we're, we still don't know about even this machine that we get to spend our earth's time (laughs) in it's just so cool it's i love hearing you nerd out about it too (laughs) (laughs) it's stupid i know people are like this girl is crazy no 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 (laughs) i because you i don't know for me i i find you know passion is contagious you know and it's just (laughs) clearly you love what you do and clearly you're passionate about what it is that you do and it's just it now i'm like what do i what else should i know about my body I know nothing. I mean, like, I think I know something, but not in that same way. Um, so absolutely. No, I love the nerding out on it. And I feel like I was just on like some really cool, like Bill Nye situation just about <laughs> my nervous system. Um, yeah. I'm curious um, about all the workshops that you were talking about. Well, first of all, if one is interested in joining you in any of these, but also your various hats in teaching land, how those are operating and what what they are and yeah. Yeah. Um, so my programs that I offer through Visceral Voice. Um, so I have the the 18 week self-care program. So that's 
18 weeks, we go through jaw self-care. We go through intraoral techniques. We go through neck, shoulder, diaphragm, rib cage, pelvis, um, the diaphragm, the, re- the, sorry, the seven central diaphragms um, and what that is. Uh, I give basically a little an anatomy lecture for about 15, 20 minutes at the beginning. And then we go through different releases and that's what the self-care program is. And then um, I just offer different classes with different teachers, Um, all of, you know, any class coming up, you could always find out about on my Instagram, the visceral voice. Um, And then of course, at the website, www, you have to enter that (laughs) the visceral voice.com. Just the visceral voice doesn't come up. I don't know why. Um, Someone more tech savvy would know why I don't. Yeah. yeah, and then. But what are you doing with the Met? Yeah. What's that? So I am the movement coach for their Young Artist Program. Yeah, yeah. What is that so... for you? How is that going? <laughs> <laughs> it's going well. It's been. Um, I'm. I'm learning a lot, and the artists are incredible. And I saw Idomeneo at the Met, and oh my gosh, these voices and the lead of the show, the title role, Idomineo comes in and the very first thing that happens is rolls down the stairs. And I, I mean, like if this were a film, they would have had a double, right? Yeah. But, and this is an opera. And I thought, I was like, wow, this, this chorus member, like just rolled down those stairs and that was an awesome role. And that's what I'm thinking as a movement teacher and practitioner and then gets up and is is Idomineo and I, and I oh, thought yeah. what and then has this stunning voice and you know is just incredible and I was just blown away at and you know I, I hear like well I'd really like to be able to do whatever is asked of me on stage and I'm like yeah I mean they're rolling downstairs or when you're hanging from a ladder singing or when you have to like slowly go into laying on your back on a high D or, I mean, it's really amazing what's being asked of the body in, in shows and, and in our musical theater settings through choreography. I mean, being able to see if you're in a show, see, like try to get your voice teacher to go. If you're working with a personal trainer or a movement specialist, get them to go, like have your team see you in what you're doing because it's so informative to see, not that I'm working with that particular person, but a lot of uh, my clients who I do go see in a show, it's so informative of what I'm going to be working on. Mm-hmm. You know, if I have someone who's constantly having to carry someone over their right side, you know, doing 15 lifts all on the right side, uh, I'm going to have to give them some stuff to counteract that. Yeah. <laughs> because doing that eight shows a week, that's going to become a pattern in the body. Your choreography becomes a pattern. If you're constantly kicking your right leg and that's it, and it's coming into flexion and you know what your choreography is, has an effect on your body and what you need to do off stage to make sure that you're counteracting that is really important. And having your team see you in that stuff is really, really important. So, um, so yeah, I got to see that last night. It was really incredible the voices were just out of this world and you just think wow yeah I mean these are such elite vocal athletes I mean just it's incredible and um yeah and getting them to move and feel good with their movement and feel like they can do something like their colleague up there had to do with rolling down stairs and then getting up and singing a phenomenal aria that's so, really wild. What we're asked to do is it's intense. It's a lot. It's a lot with with the body. So I really give props to programs like the Met that are starting to include movement practitioners. There's also an Alexander Tech Technique teacher, uh, Matt Cahill, who who has been there um, last year as well, who's phenomenal, and he does great work. And um, so just that that these programs are starting to provide some movement Mm -hmm. um and what that looks like and and how can we move through our everyday life with 
you know, with more success and by moving through our everyday life with more success, then being able to bring that, incorporate that onto stage. Yeah. Um, as we wind down our time, is there anything else that is on your heart that we have not talked about that you feel our listeners could benefit from hearing? Um, well, I do have some kind of advice that was, or like different things that mm-hmm. was given on my podcast from Joan Later and Christine Estes about some vocal stuff. Yeah. Um, that if you don't mind, I would love to share. Never minding. Yes, um, <laughs> please. Never minding. And so Joan, and if you wanted to listen to those episodes, they are on the Visceral Voice podcast with Joan mm-hmm. later and with Christine Estes. But Joan talks about yellow flags versus red flags for vocal health. Um, so a yellow flag being like a tickle while you're voicing or you're needing to cough while you're voicing or you're feeling like the scratching burning sensation in your throat, kind of being a yellow sign of like, I need vocal rest. I need to take a vocal nap right now. And then the red flags being, um, if you're still feeling fatigued after you've slept, um, if you're not able to move from one vocal quality to another vocal quality, if you're losing your range or if you've lost some of your range, if you're feeling hoarse, those are times that you'd want to get in to see your ENT or your laryngologist just to see if anything's going on on the cords themselves. Um, And then Christine Estes talks about too much, too loud, too often. So um, this is a big one with my clients coming into the space because they'll come in and they're like at their 100% as if they're on stage, their projection. And I'm, I'm like, this is incredible. You can project, but you're also coming in because you're fatigued and you're constantly at your 100%. What is your 50%? What is your 20% when we're in a quiet space like this? Um, And then the flip side too, having been maybe much quieter during a pandemic or working a quieter job like myself now, it's very hard for me to Mm -hmm. go into a louder sound or a forte. forte. Um, So how much use? Um, And we do have different things for, they call them... um, phonotrauma and non-phonatory trauma. So phonotrauma would be like things that are happening with voice use, heavy voice use, over voice use, um, over pressurized laughter. I used to be like a big pressurized laughter person. And I know that I'd get inflamed cords from that. Hmm. Although I do think laughter is really, really important. So I have to like weigh. Yeah. Um, but that is a, that is, that does bang the cords together. And then non phonatory would be our um, clearing of the throat. So if you're getting a lot of mucus and you're clearing the throat a lot, um, just being mindful of that, maybe trying to swallow if you can. Um, If you're coughing, especially, oh, we saw a lot of stuff, obviously, with COVID. People have had COVID and were coughing. There was a new diagnosis I had never heard of. Well, it was new to me. I don't know that it was new. Um, which was ulcerative laryngitis, um, just from coughing from COVID, um, and grunt like grunting when weightlifting. If you're weightlifting, you don't need to be grunting. Um, there are better ways to breathe than like <clears throat> having mm-hmm. it be at the laryngeal level. Um, and then things you can do, you can, you know, stay hydrated. We know that stay hydrated and humidified, <laughs> um, great products. Fontis lozenges are great. Um, entertainer secret throat coat. I, I like the medicinal traditional, traditional medicinal throat coat tea, um, warming up and cooling down. A lot of people know to warm up, but not a lot of people cool down. And also a warm up doesn't only have to be vocal. We mm-hmm. want our warm ups to be full body. Um, and, uh, sometimes too, doing some vision drills, vision, vision is our brain's top priority. And so adding in some vision drills can actually help warm up our body and our voice. So including some vision stuff can be really cool and helpful. So kind of warming up our vision, warming up our body, and then maybe warming up our voice, which brings a 20 minute or 10 minute vocal warm up to, you know, a two to three minute or four to five minute vocal warm up, depending. Mm-hmm. Um, monitoring your vocal habits. So we all 
for some reason, as soon as we got on a telephone, we just talk at our 100%. We're still, like screaming into our telephones. <laughs> <laughs> when we're in our cars singing, a lot of times, same thing. The acoustics in there are terrible. So we're kind of pushing being on computers. Um, sometimes we're pushing with that. And then again, just being able to take a range. If, if this is your 100% at on stage, this is your projection for that. What is your 30% working through that? Taking vocal naps throughout your day. Christine has just called that budgeting vocal cash, which I really liked. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just think vocally, those are some really great things that I've learned from some of my colleagues that um, I don't think that they would mind me sharing. That's incredible. Thank you so much for all of that. That was um, a lot. <laughs> it's like hopefully everybody has their pens and papers out and or goes back and listens. Um, you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, but if anybody wants to work with you or your roster of incredible other people who work with you or the people that you are collaborating with, where within your boundaries can people find you, work with you, collaborate and all of that? Yeah, amazing. Um, uh, you could email me at thevisceralvoice at gmail.com. Uh, you could check out Life Light Massage, so lifelightmassage.com. Uh, uh, you could check out www.thevisceralvoice.com. Uh, you could follow me on Instagram and just kind of send me messages or whatever on Instagram, and that one's The Visceral Voice. Um, and listen to your ways. podcast, which is the yeah. Visual Voice podcast. All yeah, of this, the FYI, will be in the show notes. So if you don't have this on a piece of paper and pen, you can go there. Um, I'm endlessly grateful to you for this time. You've shared so, so, so much um, practical, emotional, I'd argue spiritual <laughs> guidance in this way. And I think it's just, you know, the more we are able to empower humans, but more specifically artists to really own and love and care for their bodies, the more we are able to sustain the work that we do, um, which is really the goal of why this podcast exists. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, to give these resources in this episode really was chock full of all of that. So I'm mm -hmm. so, so grateful to you for your time. Thank you. Well, and also the work that you're doing, like, which is just incredible. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you to you. And thank you for the work that you're doing. And you. I've been on the health panel with you a couple times yeah. and I just think you're doing amazing work. So thank, thank you for the work you're doing too. Thank you. Bye.